You are listening to the Visualizing War and Peace podcast. In each episode, we look at how people have experienced, described, or imagined armed conflict in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which representations of war and peace can have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig, and I direct the Visualizing War and Peace project at the University of St. Andrews. As regular listeners will know, to begin with, our project's focus was simply on visualizing war. But in studying narratives of conflict and the impact which they have on people, we've become very interested in the ways in which people narrate war's aftermath and conflict resolution. And this has led us to look at different habits of visualizing peace and how those habits might influence peacekeeping and peace building now and in the future. Over the past 18 months, I've been working with a fantastic team of undergraduate students to explore how peace gets conceptualised and described in different contexts and communities. Among other questions, we've been asking, what recurring stories do individuals and communities tell about war's aftermath, conflict resolution, peace and peace building in art, text, film, photography, news reports, museums, music, sculpture, gaming and other such media? Are narratives of peace always constructed in relation to narratives of war? And what, if anything, makes any given narrative identifiable as a peace story? Whose narratives or ideas of peace dominate in different parts of the world, and why? And what role can peace storytelling play in peace building? As for our work on visualising war, we're very interested in the feedback loop between narrative and reality, the ways in which the stories that we tell reflect reality up to a point, but also help to shape it by influencing how we think, feel and behave. There are important real-world applications to our work. In studying the stories that we tell about war and peace, we hope to raise awareness of the powerful ideologies which they generate over time, which are sometimes leveraged very purposefully by people in positions of social, political or military power to engineer certain kinds of behaviours, even to perpetuate or generate conflict. And we can also build capacity in individuals and groups to harness storytelling themselves, to help prevent or mitigate against the effects of conflict and promote peace. Because stories are world-building, they can function as powerful positive interventions in how and if conflict gets pursued or avoided, and we think that sharing more stories and generating more conversation about peace is a particularly important endeavour. The students involved in Visualising Peace have been doing some incredible work in this space. They've been researching the affective psychosocial impacts of storytelling, how stories in different media impact us emotionally and how we can channel that to enhance peacekeeping and peacebuilding efforts. Some have been researching religious discourses of peace, while others have examined the ways in which peace gets framed, discussed and marginalised in political debate. One team has been collaborating with a group of game designers to explore different models and markets for gaming peace, while another has been gathering data about how people relate peace to a range of physical and virtual places. Students have been researching peace linguistics, the lines of connection between inner peace and geopolitical peace, and different approaches to peace education, and this has led them to developing some new peace education resources, which they're now piloting in schools. As a group, we've also developed a virtual museum of peace, and I want to tell you a bit about that in this podcast. You'll find the link to our museum in the podcast episode notes. I'll introduce it properly in a minute, but first, I want to take you on a quick virtual tour through a real physical space the ground floor of the British Museum in London. If you turn left from the main entrance in that museum, you'll find yourself in the galleries that house artefacts from ancient Greece and Rome and the ancient Near East. There are marble statues, remnants of temples and tombs, great sculptural reliefs, pieces of armour and weaponry, painted vases, and items of jewellery, among many other objects. Everywhere you look, from the carved stone panels that once adorned palaces in Nimrud and Nineveh, to Greek temple friezes, to domestic pots and pans, you can see spears bristling, swords drawn, archers flexing their bows, chariots driving into battle, and infantry and cavalry, men and mythical creatures locked in mortal combat. Some war dead are mourned, others are triumphed over. Combat captives are marched in columns while gods of war are invoked. There are also scenes of leisure, hunting, feasting, music making and glimpses of civic, religious and domestic life far from the battlefield. But you'll struggle to find any self-conscious representations of peace or peace building on display beyond some limited narratives of conflict resolution that are inherent in images of victory or celebrations of conquest. Visitors quickly become literate in the iconography of war and violence, and items in multiple rooms join forces to tell a story that draws compelling connections between favourable gods, strong political leadership, military force and community prosperity. By contrast, ideas of peace, what it looked like, how it was experienced and how it was made, remain blurred, out of focus, hard to visualise. 
That's not simply because many of the artefacts on display in these galleries mythologize war or amplify top-down forms of conflict resolution and the advantages of belligerent leadership. For centuries, the curation of these artefacts has allowed elite perspectives, geopolitics and an obsession with empire to dominate. Information board after information board focuses our attention on those in power, on threats to their sovereignty, on shifting territorial boundaries and on stories of imperial expansion or decline, building a picture of human history in which great civilizations lurch from one conflict to the next. Of in-between times, war's aftermath, the lull between clashes, periods of peace, we can see remarkably little. References to trade, agriculture and artistic production tend to be framed in relation to war, as threatened by it or as byproducts of imperial expansion. And the work that individuals and communities did to navigate, avoid or recover from the conflicts of their era is hardly touched upon. We cannot place all the blame on the artefacts themselves. Opportunities have been missed in the curation and communication process to raise questions about the habits of visualising war which these objects promote and to explore ancient experiences and discourses of peace. This is not a strange quirk either of antiquity or of this particular museum. In the 21st century, we're surrounded by images and narratives of war, but exposed to far fewer representations or discussions of peace. It's not the case that such representations do not exist, rather they're not framed or foregrounded in ways that impact our consciousness as much as narratives of war do. As John Gittings, among others, has observed, if you walk into the average high street bookshop, you will likely find a military history section, but no equivalent shelf space devoted to the politics of peace. While many bookshops stock both fact and fiction titles that reflect on different aspects of peace and peacemaking, from inner peace to international negotiations, they're usually dispersed across different sections and not easily visible, accessible or promoted in the way that clusters of books on war are. A quick browse for films online will turn up hundreds under the popular category war film, a best-selling genre that constructs and deconstructs war in many different guises, making it feel close, familiar, known, while socialising us into viewing it for and as entertainment. By contrast, films that narrate post-conflict recovery, reconciliation, harmonious living, future aspirations, friendship across divides, and other such aspects of finding or making peace do not have a recognisable classification that unites or amplifies them. Scattered across comedy, period drama, action adventure, fantasy, science fiction and romance, they get us thinking about all sorts of phenomena, but they're rarely produced or marketed in ways that bring peace itself into focus. Peace art, peace photography and peace journalism are more established endeavours, even so they do not have the same centuries-old traditions behind them as war art and war reporting, and they've not gained as much traction amongst commissioners or consumers. Why does this matter? One objection to setting up peace films as a meaningful category is that the range of works we might classify under that label is too nebulous, too difficult to determine. Arguably, however, one reason for this is that we do not have strong traditions of peace storytelling, which would help us to recognise peace when we see it, and make us more peace literate. The more we discuss and explore a concept, the more opportunities we have to understand it. But the reverse is also true. The media that shape us individually and collectively rarely get us wrestling with peace as a concept. As a result, we struggle to visualise it or grasp it, and so tell fewer stories about it. And so the cycle goes on. Our Museum of Peace aims to make a modest contribution to wider efforts to render peace and peacemaking more visible, more discussed and better understood. This virtual exhibition space has been designed and developed by a student research team, and as I've noted already, it's grounded in an understanding of narratives as world building. Our aim is to harness the power of story sharing to illuminate different habits of visualising peace and their influence, actual or potential, on how it's experienced, promoted, created and sustained. For us, visualising peace goes well beyond simply picturing it. It involves evoking, figuring, engendering and ultimately realising it, narrating peace into certain ways of being. Our project is both disruptive of entrenched habits and generative of new or different ways of thinking about and working towards peace. By juxtaposing a myriad or kaleidoscope of different manifestations of peace, we aim to question, challenge and stretch assumptions and interpretative frameworks. And we hope that our array of exhibits not only helps to make peace more visible and more broadly understood, but also more tangible and realisable in the everyday. As you'll see if you browse through our galleries, we've organised our contents into eight different virtual rooms, which pose questions to the visitor about different aspects of peace and peace building. What distinguishes peacekeeping from peacemaking, for example? How do we visualise post-conflict recovery from physical rebuilding to inner healing? 
What role do campaigning and activism play in peace building? And what other ways have humans found to build and nurture peace in our homes, communities and the wider world? What kinds of people do we associate with peace and peace building and whose perspectives on peace tend to get marginalised? What challenges and opportunities does the digital age bring for peacekeeping? How might climate change affect the ways we understand and build peace? And what conversations do we need to have about peace in space as that domain becomes increasingly commercialised and weaponized? In each room, a wide range of entries connected with each topic helps the visitor to explore those big questions. Big questions, but with tangible connections to our everyday lives. That's something we really try to bring out. And the sheer diversity of contents, from political theory to comedy to art to inner peace education to digital media, music, fashion and environmentalism, underlines the very many different ways in which peace can be understood, imagined, promoted and produced by both groups and individuals, including each one of us. As I said, the development of this virtual peace museum has been a collaborative endeavour and we've really benefited from a diversity of backgrounds. The members of our student and staff team come from many countries, ethnic groups, religions, socioeconomic classes and education systems. Even so, we're aware that we're still very much positioned within a privileged space in Western, specifically British academia. For that reason, we've thought very carefully about how to increase viewpoint diversity, how to incorporate and include a wide range of voices, experiences and positions so that privileged ideas of peace do not dominate. This is inevitably a work in progress, but as we continue to add new entries, we're trying to ensure broader representation across genders, generations, cultural and religious identities, regions, socioeconomic backgrounds and life experiences. Most of the museum's creators have experienced high levels of peace and very little conflict in their lives. So we've had to think hard about the ethics of visualising peace for others in ways that speak to multiple complex experiences, not just our own. Whose experiences and ideas of peace are we allowing to take centre stage? And what models or definitions should we give space to, from belligerent forms of securitization to campaigns for human rights, justice and equality, to uprising and revolution, to care for others and the environment? One person's security might be another person's repression. One person's pacifism might pave the way for another person's colonisation. Some peace museums push a particular agenda. The Museum of Peace in Bradford in the UK, for instance, has strong connections with the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Our approach is not to promote certain visions of peace ahead of others, but rather to expose the many different understandings and approaches that humans have experimented with over the years as a valuable archive or repository of options, pathways to peace that we can continue to explore in the future, depending on individual circumstances. If we've learned anything from our curation of different concepts of peace, it's that it can be understood and achieved in an extraordinary range of ways. And we want to celebrate that because it's an empowering message. Lots of theories of peace building pitch different methods against each other. But our museum helps us to see that peacemaking is creative, sometimes opportunistic, experimental, sometimes accidental, challenging, conscientious, contentious and always evolving. And we think that having an archive of contrasting approaches is a very rich resource for us all to draw on, whether we're peace practitioners or simply ordinary people going about our everyday lives. While we are a university-based research team, we've made a conscious effort to listen to voices beyond academia and to explore representations of peace in less mainstream media. Our museum features graffiti, children's drawings, music, dance, online games, yogic practices, autoethnography, cyber activism, environmental movements and fashion alongside prayer, poetry, film, novels, history, political debate and scholarship. While academics undoubtedly play an important role in shaping our understanding of and approaches to peace, the world of university research can sometimes feel detached from practical societal concerns and peace practitioners can find critical theory difficult to access or implement on the ground. As I've noted, storytelling in popular media also plays an important role in shaping and cementing ideas of and attitudes to war and peace. For that reason, our museum brings lots of different voices into dialogue, bridging divides between scholars, peace practitioners, storytellers and story consumers via an inclusive conversation space. Such a cross-cutting conversation space is very important because peace is conceived and made by all of us, not just by experts. While peace museums do exist around the globe, such as the International Peace Museum or the Kyoto Museum for World Peace, access to them is necessarily limited to those who either live in the area or have the means to travel. 
However large, their physical dimensions also set a limit to the volume, range and kinds of material that can be on display. Our online platform not only democratises access, enabling anyone with an internet connection to explore, but it also invites the visitor to become a co-curator with us by offering opportunities for feedback, new suggestions and interaction. As you'll notice if you browse our exhibits, each entry ends with a set of questions designed to prompt reflection and elicit responses. Our what do you think sections encourage visitors to see each entry as the start of a conversation with us and each other too. We genuinely want to hear how other people and communities understand, imagine and depict peace. Our digital platform not only supports themed virtual rooms, but also allows us to present our contents in a range of other configurations at the same time, not possible in a physical space. Each individual entry includes cross-references and hyperlinks to other items in different parts of the museum, prompting direct comparisons. And our tagging system generates fresh juxtapositions between items curated separately from each other each time you click on a new tag. Through this mix of specific cross-references and looser groupings, the mosaic becomes a genuine kaleidoscope with new contrasts and connections coming into focus each time you visit. Each contributor to our museum has added visualisations of peace based on their own areas of expertise and interest, from top-down to grassroots peacebuilding, utopian to dystopian ideas, belligerent to pacifist models, geopolitical to personal conceptions, aftermath to futures thinking. Postgraduate Jenny Oberholzer, for instance, has included a Pentagon Peace Pal in the museum to get us thinking about how some objects and environments entwine military power and peace. As she writes, in the Pentagon gift shop, children and adults can cuddle up to peace while browsing militarised and militarising merchandise. This toy for children is sold in the same building that represents the military power responsible for the overthrow of multiple governments and the ensuing humanitarian disasters, not to mention internal issues of violence and assault within the military itself against its own personnel. The juxtaposition brings peace and conflict into each other's orbit as complementary bedfellows equal partners in a shared vision. The Peace Pal's rainbow colours and cheerful smile sanitise the atmosphere with a bright reminder of what everyone is fighting for. It may go unnoticed by many, but for the children who pick it up and the adults who glimpse it in their peripheral vision, this simple teddy bear contributes to wider ways of visualising war as a pathway to peace. Undergraduates Claire Percival and Joe Walker, meanwhile, have done a deep dive into conscientious objection and other philosophies of non-violence, encouraging visitors to think about the role that ethics and religion can play in how people visualise peace, and raising questions also about how effective idealism can be in contrast to pragmatism in working towards peace. As part of her research into the relationship between peace and space, Eleni Spiliotes has critiqued a series of aspirational architectural projects which visualise calm, contented futures for their potential residents. Grace Bittner, Isabel Frazier and Atelier Meden, meanwhile, have looked into peace and peace building in the cyber realm, encouraging us to consider the contributions made by social media, surveillance technologies and even hacktivism. Personal creative projects, graphic design, pencil sketches, creative writing and interpretative dance sit alongside analysis of other people's visualisations of post-conflict recovery and peacemaking. For example, we feature the Green Mosul Initiative, directed by historian, blogger and activist Omar Mohammed, which embodies grassroots peacebuilding in multiple ways, by involving teams of volunteers from diverse social and religious groups to plant trees and restore Mosul's natural environment as part of wider restoration work within and around the city. And in another entry on Mosul, we discuss historian Emily Mayhew's wonderful vision of post-conflict healing and growth as the slow return of honey to the city, hope in a jar, a vision which prompts us to ask our museum visitors what other connections they can see between beehives, beekeeping, post-conflict recovery and peace building, and what other foodstuffs they might associate with peace. Reflecting on a conflict closer to home, student Harris Sidafin has created a collage to capture the fragility of peace in Northern Ireland while Arden Henley has written a series of screenplays exploring how genres like comedy and horror can shape how we understand and experience different manifestations of peace, personal, social and political. And inspired by a range of poems that reflect on the struggle to find peace after forced migration, Marius de Curtis has contributed a series of black and white drawings which capture some of his views on peace as a Greek Cypriot living in a place deeply marked by conflict and displacement. As he explains, Picasso used the freedom and abstraction of modernism to show the complexity, chaos and atrocities of war. But he thinks that peace can be just as complex and convoluted, so he chose to follow a similar style. His black and white colour scheme is designed to evoke but also challenge black and white conceptions of peace as simply the binary opposite of war. 
Indeed, he's packed symbolism into his drawings, which aim to show that experiences of peace and war can be synchronous. As he puts it, this is exactly how all the poets I've read visualise peace for refugees and forced migrants, as liminal figures that mediate between conflict and peace. Other items in our museum feature children's voices on peace. By the time we reach adulthood, we've often been socialised into very particular ways of thinking about peace. Living in the UK, for example, people grow up learning about and indeed celebrating Armistice Day, Victory in Europe Day and other events and anniversaries connected with the end of the First and Second World Wars. Ideas of peace feature in the lyrics of popular music, and children read books and watch films such as The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Beauty and the Beast, Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, stories which end happily with conflict resolution and calm after violence and disorder. Alongside coverage of contemporary conflicts, they may have seen footage of anti-war protests with an array of peace symbols from Picasso's iconic dove to the peace and love sign designed in the 1950s for the campaign for nuclear disarmament. And they may have heard calls for world peace or community harmony in religious contexts. How do children themselves imagine, understand and describe peace? The smells, tastes and sounds which they mentioned in conversations with our researchers made it clear how strongly the children we interviewed connected peace with two things, home and happiness. Lollipops, fish food, ice cream, macaroni and pie, comfort food and treats. Hugs with their family were mentioned several times. They talked a little of peace as something quiet and contemplative. For example, several described being curled up with a book as a peaceful experience, while another described sitting still in the garden at night while Swift swooped by. But they also chatted excitedly about trampoline time, doing front flips, going to theme parks and playing with friends as peaceful activities. For them, peace was almost synonymous with the ingredients that make up a happy, secure childhood. In a nutshell, peace is everyday fun. Between them, our diverse museum entries help us to rethink the connections we often make between peace and nature, peace and love, peace and justice, peace and women, and peace and security, among many other pairings. And they get us thinking about historic, religious and culturally specific conceptualizations of peace alongside modern, secular, political and theoretical models. Student Thomas Frost, for example, gets us wrestling with the apocalyptic imagery in T.S. Eliot's poem Little Gidding, inviting us to think about versions of peace that involve acceptance of horror, loss and grief. While Margot de Sers helps us conceptualise peacemaking as simple acts of love and friendship. And other visualisations in the museum remind us that everything from sustainable fashion to the fight for equal rights can contribute to collective efforts to build a more peaceful future. We have curated around 100 items so far, and the result is a smorgasbord of different concepts, intellectual framings and imaginaries, local, regional and transnational. Individually, all exhibits transcend the tropes, clichés and symbols traditionally associated with peace, and together, as they interact and temper each other, they challenge dominant concepts, dismantle long-standing frameworks and push us to consider visualisations of peace and mechanisms of peace building that are often overlooked. The structure of the museum encourages visitors to explore open-mindedly, without a sense of trajectory or hierarchy, and we hope that each visit to the museum represents an ongoing process of critical discovery of possibly endless conceptualisations. Our entries are not to be taken didactically, they merely offer an opening to further interrogation and understanding. As I've said, we don't wish this project to be seen as the be-all and end-all of how one should or could visualise peace. Rather, it's a metaphorical call to lay down arms in a collaborative, open-ended exploration of prevailing habits and alternative ways of picturing, framing, evoking and engendering peace through many different lenses. So I hope you enjoyed that whirlwind tour of our virtual Museum of Peace. Please do visit it and tell us what you think, and we would love to hear your suggestions about other ideas or visions of peace which you think we could add to our collection. Our museum is evolving all the time as new entries are added, and we find it really energising to hear new perspectives. I've been asked a few times which is my favourite item in the museum, and it's an impossible question to answer, because there are so many fascinating entries. But what I have enjoyed most of all is having my own understanding of peace and peace building challenged and stretched by other people's often unexpected visions of peace. Coming up on the podcast, we will have some Visualising Peace students sharing aspects of their recent work. Next week, for example, student Ottilia Meden will be interviewing Dr. Roxani Cristali about practices of love, care and self-care in the wake of violence as important dimensions of peace building. So do listen out for that. And if you'd like to think and talk more about war and peace, please join the conversation by getting in touch with us. You can follow us on social media, just search for Visualising War or Visualising Peace, or contact us directly by emailing us at viswar at standrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young. The show was mixed by Zafia Gertin. 
Thank you very much for listening.